9,888,373. That's how many people were in this brand spanking new ultra processed food study that was setting out to identify if there really was a relationship between ultra processed food consumption and adverse health effects. Now I'm gonna read you a quote that was directly from this study that explains kind of why this study was in place and what it was setting out to find. No comprehensive umbrella review has offered a broad overview and assessment of existing meta-analytic evidence when it comes down to processed foods. What that essentially means is we've got all kinds of different data, even meta-analysis and various observational research and various epidemiological bodies of research that look at the consumption of ultra-processed foods, but nothing was really looking at a big umbrella. So what was the purpose of this study? Well, it was to look at a lot of data and to see how strong of a relationship there is between consuming lots of processed foods and, well, just overall bad health outcomes and metabolic effects. Here's what they found in a nutshell. First, we have to understand the five classifications that they broke this study down into, the five sort of findings. There was class one, which was convincing data. Okay, so remember they looked at almost 10 million people here. So class one was very convincing data. Class two was highly suggestive, which is still very strong. Class three was suggestive, meaning still favoring, right? And then class four was weak and class five was lacking evidence, okay? When they looked at this all together, 9% of all the studies and outcomes that they looked at fell under class one. So 9% were extremely convincing that ultra processed foods were linked to adverse health outcomes. 16% were class two, highly suggestive. Okay, so we've got nine and 16 basically in strong favor of ultra processed foods causing a problem. And then we have class three, which was suggestive. So still suggesting that ultra processed foods cause adverse health outcomes, 29%. So as of right now, we're at 54% skewed towards suggestive all the way to convincing. So we're slightly skewed towards, okay, ultra processed foods are probably problematic. And then 18% fell under class four with weak evidence and another 29% actually fell under lacking evidence. So in some ways, this actually complicates things even more, but there's a big problem that we also have to look at with this. This was epidemiological data, which is important and probably the biggest thing you can look at when you're looking at large pools of data and large meta-analyses but there were no randomized controlled trials. These were looking at a varying amount of dose response and non-dose response studies, which is still important, very, very valid. But what we're really trying to discover here is like, what is the problem here? Are ultra processed foods really causing a problem? And with this, we need to look at a few things. But to understand this, we need to understand what the difference is between ultra processed foods and whole foods. So we really can understand why they could be problematic. For one, there's typically a poor nutrient profile. Like ultra processed foods, you're gonna have less of the overall vitamins and minerals, right? Number two, which might even be a bigger problem is the displacement. The fact that the more ultra processed foods that are consumed, the less whole foods that are consumed. So when you're looking at epidemiological data, it's not a randomized controlled trial saying, hey, these people are eating ultra processed foods, these people are not. It's looking at the fact that they're still getting their calories in, but they're getting it in from processed foods and therefore not eating whole foods, so they're lacking nutrition there. So is it the, the problem actually the ultra processed foods being added in, or is it the fact that they're displacing the wholesome foods? And then of course, the other issue is the alteration of the physical structure. Like when you puree a food or when you take it into a refined form, it changes a little bit of the food matrix. It changes how food is absorbed and used, right? So those of course are issues, but let's look at one of the meta-analyses that was in this larger umbrella review that was published in Nutrients. It was pretty alarming because what they found in this is that 80% of the American and Canadian diets are made up of ultra processed foods, 80%. But what is illuminated to be 
what I would consider an even bigger issue, is there is an inverse linear relationship with the ultra-processed food intake and their whole food intake. So in a very clear linear fashion, the more ultra-processed food they take in, the less overall wholesome food they take in. That might actually be the problem. I'm not the biggest fan of ultra-processed foods. Don't get me wrong, I think they're a huge problem. But I do think that the fact that they're replacing the wholesome foods with the protein and the fiber and whatnot, that's probably an even bigger issue. They also found in this study that the intake of free sugars, free fats, free saturated fats all went up, all while protein, fiber, and pretty much all vitamins and minerals went down, clearly leaving us with a gap here, right? But there's other issues beyond just that because if you look at that, you could say, okay, as long as people are consuming whole foods, some ultra-processed foods aren't gonna hurt. And that's probably the case. Like the occasional ultra-processed foods, probably not going to be an issue. It's more so when it becomes chronic consumption. Ahem, like 80% of our intake in America, I would say that's a chronic problem. But the other issues that come into play are what's called dietary reconstitution, right? So when you have the food matrix disrupted, if you have a food that is normally designed to be consumed in a whole grain and now it's pulverized into a powder and saturated with an emulsifier and what, that's disrupting the food matrix and that may change how the microbiome interacts with the food. So that's an issue in and of itself. Then there's what is called the quote unquote cocktail effect. In a sense, one additive to a food may not be bad, but some of the research suggests that when you have multiple additives in food, so some of the research suggests that when you have like one additive in processed food or food, it's not that bad. But when you have multiple additives in processed food, you have a quote unquote cocktail effect of all these different additives. And that could be more problematic than just a single additive. And then of course you have the denaturing, the heating, the adulteration that occurs. When you heat a food, you have these, the formation of things like acrylamide or acrylin. These are known carcinogens when you heat foods to a really high degree or you denature them by frying them or whatnot. So these things are in addition to the fact that, well, we're not eating whole foods and then we're now eating food that's devoid of nutrients. Now we have these other issues at play. So what this study is really showing us is that we have more and more compelling evidence suggesting that ultra-processed foods are actually problematic. And if you look at the different meta-analysis that are in this umbrella review, it gets kind of scary so much so that we could really go on for days talking about like fear-mongering things that would scare you away from ultra-processed foods. But I wanna look at some other studies that aren't just epidemiological. Like let's look at how ultra-processed foods actually affect fat loss. There was a very interesting study that I think you'll find interesting. So this study was published in Cell Metabolism. And what they did is they had subjects consume an ultra-processed food diet with just ultra-processed foods or a whole food diet. They did it for two weeks and then they swapped. And they did everything they could to match the macronutrients. Okay, so they matched for carbohydrates, they matched for even to certain degrees other macros, and they also matched for calories the best they could. But keep in mind, this was also ad libitum. They were told they could eat as much as they want. So it's hard to like match for calories with the exception of certain contained elements. What they found is that those that ate the ultra processed food diet consumed on average about 500 calories more. Okay. And a good majority of them coming from carbohydrates, the rest coming from fats. So in this case, 280 additional calories from carbohydrates and about 230-ish from fat. And when they did the swap same thing happened. So the bottom line was that they definitely ate more. So it's not that ultra-processed foods are potentially like altering our chemistry, they're just more palatable and we want to eat more of them. Now, of course, they also noticed that weight was gained when the ultra-processed food group was eating their ultra-processed food, which makes sense because they were eating a lot of calories and they were directly able to associate the weight gained with the excess of calories. So in this particular case, even though some will kind of poke holes in it, calories were king in this particular case. And it's hard to determine if it has to do with the high glycemic nature of the refined starches that people were eating or what, because we don't have that data but it probably had something to do with it. I'm not completely opposed to occasionally having processed food. I just don't think your entire diet should be made up of it because it's hard to self-govern. I went ahead and I put a link down below, by the way, for Thrive Market. 
If you do want to try to get off of processed foods, they're an awesome sponsor that's been on my channel for like five, six years now. The reason I say get off of processed foods is because they have a lot of foods that can still be pantry staples that are not really the typical processed foods. So no additives, no weird stuff, no gums. They're like pretty close to whole foods, like things that have a couple of ingredients in them, like crackers that might just have, literally they have like flackers crackers, which are just flax seeds, some rosemary and salt. Technically that's processed, but that's a pretty darn whole food to me, right? So they have foods like that. That is a 30% off discount link for your entire grocery order through Thrive Market. I do recommend you try it out. Just because the selection of foods that they have, especially if you're in a place where you don't have like a Whole Foods or a, like a healthy grocery store nearby, it gets delivered to your doorstep in a couple of days and it really does make life easy. And you can sort by diet type. It's an online membership-based grocery store, super convenient. And again, that is a 30% off discount link for your entire grocery order. So you save 30% off everything you put in your cart that first time that you try it out. And that link is in the top line of the description underneath this video. The other piece of the equation is the low-grade chronic inflammation. There was another study that was published in the journal Nutrients that determined that ultra-processed foods seem to be correlated with increased levels of low-grade inflammation. One of the reasons that this could be happening mechanistically is the fact that when you have these chronically high insulin spikes that are coming from refined starches, and again, the overconsumption because you're always hungry, this can be problematic for levels of inflammation in the body. Insulin is fine. Having a spike in insulin and blood sugar is perfectly normal and healthy, but when it's constantly happening and you're never coming down from it, that can absolutely be a cause of low-grade inflammation. You also have these industrially processed fats, like trans fats and hydrogenated oils, which are very closely linked with inflammation. I talked about a study in another video recently that found that in the highest quintile of trans fat consumption, their C-reactive protein, their inflammation levels were 73% higher than those that were consuming the lowest amounts of trans fats. But also what we have to note is that when you are eating ultra processed foods and 80% of your diet is made up of it, that's 80% less wholesome foods with anti-inflammatory effects that you're not consuming, right? So you're replacing foods that would normally quell inflammation with foods that trigger it. The other thing that's really interesting is if we look at the glycemic effect of ultra-processed foods. So another interesting study published in Cell Metabolism was a little bit more intricate in its design, and it found that at baseline, when they took a look at people that were consuming ultra-processed foods versus people that were consuming whole foods, they both had a baseline HOMA IR of 2.8. HOMA IR is almost a, somewhat of a lagging indicator of your insulin resistance over the last period of time. So it's a very good way of looking at if someone is insulin resistant or not. What they found is that HOMA IR surprisingly didn't change. So the levels of insulin resistance in a relatively short amount of time didn't change between someone that is eating ultra processed foods or someone that is eating whole foods. But what they did find is those that were eating whole foods had significantly better insulin sensitivity. So in the short term, insulin sensitivity was improved dramatically, probably because inflammation was lower. So something is going on there, and this data may have just been a short enough snapshot in time that we didn't see the HOMA IR actually be reflected yet, because HOMA IR might take a while for that to reflect. You have to kind of be insulin resistant for a little while before you might see a massive increase in your HOMA IR. But the fact that it was increasing insulin sensitivity to eat whole foods is pretty powerful. And then there was a study that was published in Nutrients, and this is alarming data, so I hope you're hearing this. In Nutrients, they published that for every 10% increase in ultra-processed food intake, there is a 15% increased risk of type 2 diabetes. For every 10% more ultra-processed food you eat, a 15% increase in your risk of type 2 diabetes. And it's hard to say, is it from the additives, the garbage in the ultra-processed food, or is it flat out because when you eat the ultra-processed food, you're not eating the whole foods? I'm inclined to think that it's the latter. I think whole foods contain the nutrient density and the truthfully, the, the flat out vitamins and minerals and the fiber and the protein and everything that we need to function as human beings. And the more that we just replace that, we're just missing out. I think it's less on the additive side of what ultra processed foods are doing to us, and it's more about what they're replacing. However, I think the ultra processed foods definitely have some garbage in them, but I think a good diet, good exercise, and having a healthy lifestyle 
can supersede that. It can overshadow that if that is the majority. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.